Good evening. I'm Glenn Lowry, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation with Alondra Nelson, Homi Baba, and Charles Taylor about appropriation, authority, and the democratic imagination. We are being live streamed on our YouTube channel, and so a warm welcome to our online audience as well. The origin of this conversation began with a discussion among several colleagues here at the museum, including Kathy Halbreich, Associate Director and Lawrence Foundation Curator, as well as the newly appointed president of the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Leia Dickerman, who just became the museum's first director of editorial strategy and content, and who has led our conversations about equity, citizenship, and borders for several years, while also curating exhibitions like Rob Robert Rauschenberg Among Friends that has just closed and brought sadness to all of us as it disappeared. Thomas Lax, associate curator in the Department of Media and Performance Art, and Pablo Helguera, an artist and director of adult and academic programs at the museum, and I thank them all for their support and their ideas. We wanted to explore how identity is represented and how images are used in the wake of the many heated discussions about particular artworks at places like the Museum of Contemporary Art in St. Louis, the Whitney Biennial, and the Walker Art Center, among other places, without repeating the important conversations that have already taken place. What all of these earlier conversations have in common is a questioning of who has the authority to speak and for whom, and how is that authority acquired and arbitrated? So we decided to convene a group of leading thinkers who could bring their distinct perspectives to this question and reframe it in the context of what authority and by extension authorship means against the backdrop of recent political and social events. Alondra Nelson is professor of sociology and gender studies at Columbia University where she has served as the inaugural dean of social science and director of the Institute for Research on Women, Gender and Sexuality. She is also president of the Social Science Research Council and the author of numerous critically acclaimed publications, including The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome. And if you haven't read that book, I urge you to do so. It's a must read. Her interdisciplinary research focuses on how science and its applications may shape the social world, including aspects of personal identification, racial formation, and collective action. In turn, she also explores the ways in which social groups reject, challenge, engage, and in some instances, adopt and mobilize conceptualizations of race, ethnicity, and gender derived from scientific and technical domains. Homi Baba is the Anne F. Rothenberg Professor of the Humanities and Director of the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard. His extensive and insightful writings on art, culture and humanities have helped to shape the field of post-colonial studies and his work on hybridity, ambivalence, cultural difference and enunciation are central to any discussion of these issues. Among his many achievements are the recent Padma Bhusan, one of India's most important honors, and the Humboldt Prize, which he won, I believe, last year. Homi is well known to us here as a founding counselor of the museum's CMAP program, or Contemporary and Modern Art Perspectives in a Global Age, and I'm grateful to him for his friendship and advice over the many years we've known each other. Charles Taylor is one of the most distinguished philosophers alive. His numerous contributions to the study of political philosophy, the philosophy of social science, and intellectual history, as well as his writings on Hegel, identity, and communitarianism, are widely admired and have now influenced several generations of scholars. In his in addition to his work as a scholar, he has also been actively involved in politics and public life. Having been a candidate for parliament in the New Democratic Party in Canada, I think you ran against Pierre Elliott Trudeau, to, uh, the, for, the, the father of the current Prime Minister of Canada, and he served on the Conseil de la Langue Française in the 1990s, and more recently in 2007, he co-chaired the important Bouchard-Taylor Commission on the reasonable accommodation of cultural difference in the province of Quebec. He has won also numerous awards, including the prestigious Kyoto, Kluge, Templeton, and last year, Bergruen Prizes. Although retired from McGill, he writes and lectures extensively, and I'm thrilled that he's here with us tonight as well. 
So please welcome Alondra, Homie, and Chuck. I can't think of a better group of people with whom to have a conversation. We'll talk for about an hour among ourselves, and then we'll take questions from the audience for about a half an hour. If you'd like to pose a question, please write it on one of the index cards that have been provided to you in the theater. And if you're watching on live stream, please leave questions in the comments section. So, here we are, uh, and we want to try and drive into some of the issues surrounding the current debate against the backdrop of this moment. And one of the issues that I think we ought to start with is what does authority mean and where do we get it from? And, and, and why do we even need it? So, Chuck, yeah. authority. Okay, authority. Well, the thing is that it is two very different kinds, and we mustn't confuse them. One is a kind that's based on a rule, you know, or I become sheriff and I can have authority to arrest you. There's a rule there. But the other is the kind where when someone speaks, people really listen, and someone else speaks, they don't listen. And that's kind of informal authority. We have that, you know, in, we talk about that in academics and in museums. So-and-so is the great authority on Leonardo. Well, that means that he sort of commands that. I think one of the most difficult political questions in our world is how to rectify certain imbalances in this informal authority. That is, some people from some positions just don't get listened to, and other people do how to rectify the imbalances, which, which would mean not by making new rules, that's another kind of authority, but by changing the real way people perceive each other and when, <clears throat> what's is seen as important and so on. And I think that you know, the various cultural institutions like museums and universities can really do something about that. Alondra, yeah. why do we need authority? Well, I think a, a, a sociological response says that we need authority to make others comply. So it's, I mean, I think that there's a, um, a d definition of authority that's always quite dark and is always about getting others to, um, one might say, bend to another's will, right? Um, and, you know, Weber offers for us three types of, to add along to Charles's two ways of thinking about authority. You know, Max Weber gives us three ways of thinking about authority. There's a kind of charismatic authority. Um, there's a kind of legal and rational authority that really um, typically resides kind of in a nation state. Um, and then there is a, a kind of traditional authority, which is about, um, uh, you know, I think a royal family or a kind of heredity, uh, hereditary kind of uh, leadership might be um, uh, most typical of that. And I think, What's fascinating about this moment is that we have a mix-up of all three of these. Um, and so we have the emergence of leaders that are um, in some ways familial, um, they, who come out of familial legacies. We have leaders who um, come out of tradition in the sense of this is what our leaders have looked like and we're going to go back to leaders that look like these authorities. Um, and we certainly have, in fact, and often are driven by in the US and elsewhere, a kind of authority in leadership, at least at the top echelons, that's about a charisma that borders on the irrational. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, Weber's t classifications are interesting in that they are, um, in this moment, all remixed um, in a way. Homie, do you want to pick that up and also talk about the relationship maybe between authority and identity and how they play out? Yes, Glenn, I actually just want to echo uh, the end of Alondra's uh, talk about the current situation and the mix-up of different forms of authority uh, that we have, where charisma can, is, can be used for corruption, where uh, a sense of dignity, which, we, which I think is a very important aspect of authority, the dignity to others, but also adjudicating your own role as an authoritative fig figure with dignity. Dignity today is very much part of the trappings. It's empty. It's uh, part of a, a certain kind of status or institutional uh, position, but really it has lost its meaning. So there's an empty emptying out. But I think one of the 
reasons why this question is so central uh, today is that in several countries, we have a phenomenon of what I call broad chests and narrow margins. You have these rather titanic male figures. Um, um, India, uh, Turkey, uh, well here, Austria now, Austria, although he's slightly lethe and quite elegant. But uh, he, in India, of course, Mr. Modi says, you know, I have a 47-inch chest and I will take anything you throw at me. But they also st sit on very small margins. So they are authoritative, but their authorities are threatened. You know, the mar margins of votes on which they have been placed there are very small. So I think we're in this peculiar mo mo uh, moment. But I think just the larger question of what we called, and here I refer back to you, Charles, uh, authority deficits. How are we to deal with authority deficits and where do they come from? And I think in, and I'm talking broadly here, but in nation states, there is a kind of authority deficit in the relation between the majoritarian ruling perspective and those who consider themselves minorities. I just want to put that down there. It's a crude distinction, but I think it's one. There's a kind of majoritarianism. Uh, and then there are those who are peripheralized for whatever reasons. And between them, I think there is a majority deficit. Sometimes we call it the politics of identity, sometimes the politics of, of difference. And I think what is so um, immediately palpable, both for the university and for um, institutions that deal with representation, is that those who do not have their authority are somehow denied the right to be the authors of their own experience. Whether it's an experience of suffering, whether it's an experience of vulnerability, the authorship to, to be able to create your narrative seems to be what is threatened, which is why you have invisibility, which is why you don't have voice, and you don't have uh, uh, a, a, a sense of your own author, your authorizability to speak. You don't feel authorized, you don't feel them. You, that reminds me of an op-ed piece, uh, piece that Kelly Oliver wrote in the New York Times that some of you might have seen uh, today about what she calls the age of outrage, uh, where pain and suffering are equated with moral authority. That when those who feel marginalized don't have, don't, don't feel they have a voice, they turn to um, a, a different tactic, and, and clearly some of that is at play, uh, I think, with all of these issues around the question of appropriation. But, it, and she goes on to say, um, and where identity politics has become a kind of oppression Olympics, uh, highly charged uh, position. And, and I wonder whether this is in fact what's happening around these debates about appropriation, where, where the issues of legitimate pain, suffering, anxiety, are being uh, transferred to a notion of a moral authority to speak on behalf of, of those who, who are suffering. I mean, I think it's the extraordinary thing about the late 20th century, uh, René Girard made this point, that being a victim is now an, an <laughs> a move that authorizes in a certain way. I mean, you know, in the earlier days, the fascist movement, they didn't have that that sense at all. They were glorying in being powerful. But now, even the people that are repeating the, some of the same policies as the fascist movement are saying, we've been victimized. You know, these elites, unrepresentative elites, are helping all these outsiders, and we're, 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 we're suffering. So there's a kind of, you're right, there's a very unhealthy Olympics for who, is, who wins the gold medal for being a victim. Okay. And which, of course, if you get that and you win that, you totally blot out any understanding of anyone else who might be. <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I missed the Oliver piece, um, so I, I can just take from, from uh, how you described it, Glenn. I mean, I, I think what, what's being described um, as the, the sort of um, oppression Olympics is the, suggests to me the kind of ultimate authority deficit, right? That. Um, you know, moral authority doesn't get you much. Um, and so um, uh, it doesn't um, change policing tactics, it doesn't change schools, it doesn't, and so 
um, there's a sort of sense, you know, what I think is so interesting about, particularly in this moment, um, the sort of um, bouncing around of the term identity politics, and we want to, I would think it'd be interesting to think about this moment and why it's sort of something that we're talking about as opposed to maybe in 1985 or 1995 and what about this moment. Um, but it, it's always to me been a phrase that's not been um, uh, um, a sort of user's category, as you might say in ethnographic um, terms. It's not the category that people use to talk about their politics. It's a category or a phrase that's attributed to other people and it's always been attributed as a kind of accusation or as something that um, uh, was meant to suggest that the politics were kind of illegitimate. And I think that, um, uh, you know, so, so I would say that because there's always um, a, a kind of power dynamic, um, you know, that it's operating, um, and there's a denial of a power dy dynamic operating certainly with, uh, you know, sort of white nationalist politics happening now, um, that we should not, um, be captured by a kind of flattening of experience that would allow it to be um, a kind of oppression Olympics. It's actually not. There are actually, um, there are normative and ethical things we can say in the world, and there are people who are truly victims and people who are not. And these can be arguable things, but I think that we can say something about them. And so, um, you know, I think I'd, the identity politics piece, I would really want it to challenge us to think about whose category that is and whether or not, um, People in the, you know, we could use other categories. We could use new social movements. We could use late 20th century politics. Um, you know, and, and there's a kind of um, uh, politicization around identity politics that I think makes it um, not only not conceptually useful, but I think also um, um, makes us, it, it makes it impossible to actually really listen to um, the articulations that people are making about their victimhood, which may or may not be legitimate. It seems to me that one of the dimensions of this is this, this notion of echo chambers, right? That identity politics quickly connect, or, or those who identify in certain ways quickly create their own networks. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things that struck so many people after this last election in uh, November of 16 was how everybody, didn't matter which side of the political spectrum you were on, had been operating in some kind of self-contained uh, echo chamber. And so I, I'm interested in how social media act, plays into this, that, that those echo chambers didn't seem so prevalent before. Uh, and now, does social media facilitate that? Does it, in fact, uh, create it? You know, um, <clears throat> this is the question really now of representative democratic politics and how you create a social media which has responsibility and security. Because if you are um, interfering, uh, as the allegations are that, say, the Russians are within, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an election in all kinds of masked and hidden ways, then social media is not simply the kind of communicative, instantly communicative, convening operation. It's also a very stealthy thing, and it's, and it's frightening now to understand you know, how you can protect this element, how you can give it some sort of responsibility. But it seems to me <clears throat> that it's very important to see this current moment in the context in which we are being placed. And it's also interesting, I think, that the term appropriation, as it is used now, uh, whether you're for or you're against it, is a misnomer. Because the word appropriate, the concept of appropriation as it is, you know, the, as it is popularly used, is really misappropriation. What people are saying is, my history is being misappropriated. My, the images to do with my people are being misappropriated. So I think we started the discussion around misappropriation. That's the real charge. It's not about appropriation. Now, it, it then I think we get some grasp on what is happening. And I, I do feel that in this moment, where so many minoritarian forms of personhood and ontologies are being continuously beaten against. If you're an undocumented child, 
you were still, you, and brought here at the age of two, you still did something. Uh, you still broke a law. Uh, if you are uh, a, t a taxpayer, but you don't have your papers, then you're a criminal. Mexicans are murderers. You know, there is so much of that going on at the moment that as much as I think that this notion that my experience is my own to represent because I had an authority deficit is a real problem because you got an authority deficit because there were two parties. There was a slaveholder and a slave. You know, Kara Walker's work is about that. Anna Divya Smiths, they see the relationality. So you can't really own your experience or you can't shut off anybody else from coming and interpreting it. I believe that. So I believe that this whole question is one of the importance of translation. But at the end of the day, there are two issues here. One, if you are continually being, def if you're continually being beaten on the head for the people you represent, the language you speak, which is a language of difference, you have to hold on to something. And I believe in this moment, many of the, uh, in, in some ways, indefensible forms of, uh, I, I don't know what, uh, of, 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 of actually the objection to various forms of representation now, saying, you know, this is our experience, don't represent it, comes because people need to protect something mm -hmm. to survive with. You know, I think that's very much of this moment. On the other hand, I think, it's very difficult to say this experience should not be open to interpretation, whether it's an experience of victimage or not, because it is only through interpretation and reinterpretation that other new voices have come into the discourse of history, of, of, of education, and whatever. So I think it's, we are in a very problematic issue where people want to hold on to that experience and yet this is the moment when those victim experiences, if I might put it that way, really need to be explored and talked about. Because I mean, I think the poison identity politics is the identity politics that shuts out recognition of anyone else's experience. I mean, yeah. that's the kind of thing we see with the so-called populist movements, that, you know, the immigrants that they're saying are ruining our society. They caricature their lives, as anybody who studies these lives knows, but they really somehow uh, make it possible to, by putting this particular image on, not to go farther. Now, the only way that we've discovered uh, to combat that is various movements that bring together people of very different experience against this kind of shutting out. And in the course of which, actually these movements are, even if they fail, they have a tremendous educative power. I mean, I've been in lots that have failed. <laughs> but but <clears throat> as we've been working together from very different points of view, you get to understand a lot of these other people that you didn't really know very well before in the course of forging some kind of alliance uh, against some a, a very general shutting out of other, other experience. Now, I understand what you're saying, uh, Homie, that when people feel shut out, they can have a reaction of nobody's gonna, nobody else talk about me and so on. And this is not, what I'm suggesting is not a talking about people but in inviting people to join a movement. And when you see some of these demonstrations against what Trump has done, I'm, I'm very encouraged by that, although I, you know, I'd like them to go a bit farther and be able to win some, some election somewhere, but very encouraged about that because this kind of lateral contact occurs where people really come to understand what other people are like and feel bonded with that. But Chuck, so, sorry, Alondra. Yeah, yeah. But Chuck, you, one has to then think what these institutions are. Yeah. that can create this kind of convergent conversation. And I yeah. use the word convergence rather than collaborative. Yeah. Because convergence assumes you come from different places. Yeah. You have different interests, but you decide on some kind of pre-agreed <clears throat> or premeditated issue yeah. to actually come together. And then you may go somewhere else again. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the one way in which I would contest certain versions of identity politics, whether they're self-assumed or imposed, that those are always have, that, 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 that notion has the sense that our identities will always somehow essentially be the same, whether they're ethnic identities or whatever. No, even within questions of ethnicity or community, identities are continually, 
shifting or changing mm. or being readjusted without yeah. being lost. Yeah. You know. So I think that what is really important is what institutions do we have to make that kind of convergence possible when there is such inequality, inequality of achievement, inequality of purpose, inequality of access, you know, that's the real issue. How do you bring people together where they feel they have an equal, you know, an, an equal purchase on the conversation? That, I think, is one of the issues we have at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it's our big challenge. And I think, but it's the challenge for democracy, right, which is always, um, the ideal of it in the United States is always claim, claim to be a kind of Habermasian deliberative process. Everyone come to the table. And it's never been never that been process, there. right? And so now when you have a moment with social media, Glenn, where everyone actually can be an author, um, it poses a challenge to democracy, a democracy that was always representative and always representative by a kind of elite class and always excluded certain people. Um, and so I, I think, you know, even as I um, am often dismayed about what we see in the political realm right now, I also think it is the potential for the most truly radical democratic exper experiment for precisely the reasons you say, homie, that like, what is it going to take to um, not necessarily agree with all of these voices, this cacophony, this volume of voices that are everywhere, authors of everywhere, but what is it going to take to try to listen and incorporate them um, in some sort of space of convergence, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's, um, I think this could be a, a moment of, you know, political possibility, and I'm encouraged by, um, and forgive me for being very U.S. focused by, you know, um, the sort of scenes of young people increasingly um, uh, running for office, imagining that they might run for office. Um, you know, I do worry that, again, going back to this identity politics piece, suggests to us that we haven't always had um, political movements and situations that were episodic and that were overlapping, that were, and, and you know, I would want to reclaim and, and, and celebrate that tradition rather than getting mired and believing um, because others say so that we are stuck in these sort of you know, tranches of our, these silos of politics that are only about identity. And again, I think that those, um, that that kind of rendering really does a kind of violence to actually what people are doing. Um, one other point I wanted to make, because you mentioned Anna Devere Smith, is she's the, her um, her you know magisterial work is a, a, such an incredible example of what could be thought to be appropriation, but what is not. I was just it's the you. perfect yeah. example, right? I mean, I think that you that um, that you know I've not heard an her an work be accused of that, and so no. it would be worth thinking about what that process is that might be rendered as a political process. I mean, we know from her process that there's deep listening there, that she spends days, hours, weeks in community, listening to communities that, you know. So I hope you're you listening say? to us, Anna. <laughs> Anna is in the audience. Yes, Where are you, Anna? <laughs> Wave. So There she is. So, Alondra. No, I, I want to pick yeah. up that. Yeah. So, so, Anna has credibility. Right? Presumably, yes, the reason yeah. that uh, she's not accused of misappropriation, mm -hmm. uh, and she works across so many different <laughs> social, ethnic, political, economic spectrums, that uh, it's remarkable that she, built, she has credibility. So I want to dig a little deeper. So how is credibility earned? Why is it that, that one knows that Anna has credibility, and in other instances, there's insecurity about that. There's doubt about credibility. And, and is credibility the right term in defining why her voice, can we call it authority, is accepted? Something to say, but do you want to? Please say it. I would just offer briefly, but you know, but Anna didn't have credibility or the same exactly. kind of credibility with Twilight. I mean, there was a first instantiation of this. Um, in the context of a very vexed interracial, interracial political moment in Los Angeles in which um, it would have been ripe for claims of, I think, appropriation, right? You know, uh, African-American woman performing Korean-Americans in Los Angeles. Um, and I think that there is um, uh, recognition, uh, listening, you, you know, that 
that I think points us in some directions of, of what helps us get around this. So I was thinking the very same thing, that Anna's practice is in some ways appropriative, but it is not being accused of misappropriation. Why? So I just jotted down four things. We could talk about this for a long time, but I think four things. One, in her, her work is a kind of creative montage of voices which she edits and juxtaposes. But there is no mastery. There is no homogeneity there. She represents the Korean woman with a certain kind of empathy, and then she will be able to represent the opposition to the Korean woman from the Afri African-American man, and then she'll be able to take uh, the, the, the person who's standing as witness. And so she's able to have these vectors or intersectional identifications. There is never, in my view, she can contradict me, you can contradict me, but there is never a sense that this is the sovereign view this is the bird's eye view. So that one is continually being repositioned when you see an Anna DeVere Smith performance. And that repositioning is not only a form of performance, it is a form of ethical yes. identification, yes, yes. re-identification, revision, restitution, redemption. It's all these things. So I think the complexity of the work gives the work from its very start its credibility. Secondly, Anna, you know, is very close to the, to the edge because she represents, she actually imitates often. Once she did me and she asked for the type of jacket I wore because she wanted to wear the same jacket. But it's never mimicry. Yes. You see, so there's a difference between mimicry and the way in which she continually keeps changing your identificatory locus, touching on the various inequalities and asymmetries of the condition she deal with. Then there is the deep research. Yeah. So Anna's work is actually quite important for museums, for universities. There is the deep research, and it's not only archival research, but the endless conversations back and forth, the dialogic, mm -hmm. the notion of alterity or otherness is being brought continually into the representation. Anna's work puts you on the edge. It doesn't simply make you feel sympathetic or empathetic. It makes you think the various links she's making. And she doesn't always provide those. And then finally, and I could go on, but I'm going to no, stop. The other thing is the way she uses different forms of media. So you're continually conceptually repositioning yourself as you're ethically repositioning yourself. That is the other, completely other side of any form of essentialist protective identification. And therefore, I, say, I said to her when we were together not so long ago, your, uh, your next main role has to be Donald Trump. I could think of no better, and I see, may say this seriously, no better, no better way than Anna's of really displacing this odious buffoon you might like him after Anna. No, I, she, would, she would make sure that I didn't like him because liking or not liking is her, you know, is her, is her axis of identification. You have your work cut out for you, Anna. Uh, I want to sort of keep, the, keep this rolling along. We, we've, we've sort of opened up a, a line into the notion of democracy and uh, I'm interested in the in the role of the citizen, and Chuck, you've talked about citizen efficacy uh, recently. And, and do you want to talk about what that means and why citizenship is so important in in framing conversations that can get us past the narrow identitarian ideas that that close down those conversations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, citizen efficacy in the sense of felt efficacy. What you have in the you know, the last 30, 40 years is a decline in citizen efficacy. That is, people are asking, can I do anything about this? No, I can't. Uh, it's all cooked, it's all, they're all corrupt, whatever the reasons are, right? And the decline in citizen efficacy is also very painful because a lot of the dignity of people in a modern society is, turns around the sense of efficacy. I can get things done. So there's a kind of hunger for uh, <clears throat> what people feel they haven't got. And the problem is that 
this has, this can have very perverse results because one of the things that happens is people tune out and people don't vote. And then that increases the actual, you know, impotence or inefficacy. So the big, big question, one of the big, big questions we have before us in a democracy is how to reverse that. I mean, how to get outlets for this great dissatisfaction, which don't increase the problem, but actually fight back against the problem. I think citizen efficacy is very important because it goes back, Glenn, to one of your opening um, questions. Now I can see that citizen efficacy, the feeling that, or the lack of citizen efficacy also relates to our uh, uh, um, uh, you know, deficiency, to the notion of deficiency that we talked about, authority deficiency. Because citizen efficacy is about agency. It's not about identity. Yeah. And agency is relational. It's institutional. So now we have a sense in which I think the notion of political, social, and ethical agency is being eviscerated and people are not being given the chances, even at a time when social media allows you to say anything in the world. It does allow you, but not everybody is the same kind of author on social media either. And so I think this citizen, uh, this authority deficiency is an agency deficiency. And we haven't un worked out a way of redefining citizenship today in which the sense of agency that relates to all the changes we are living through is, uh, has to be carefully calibrated and thought through, just as you say. And the, what we are up against, and this is something that I'm, please don't use this quote, I want to use it before anyone else does, but it's already in the public <laughs> domain. But this is something that stunned me when you talk about the dis destruction of the aura of citizenship and its dignity. I'm reading from the, I think it's The Economist. Um, the, um, this is a profile of Bannon. As Mr. Trump's campaign chief, etc., Bannon urged him to redouble the, uh, the effort. The American people understood his foibles and understood his character flaws, and they didn't care, he says. The country was thirsting for change, and Barack Obama didn't give them enough. I said, this is Bannon speaking, I said, we're going for a nationalist message. What does he mean? We are going to go barbarian, and we will win. Now, this is a, an astounding statement, and takes me back to Hannah Arendt's great concluding thought at the end of the origins of totalitarianism. When we live in one world, the barbarians are within us. They don't come from elsewhere. And I think this, when we talk of the new populism as representing, you know, the Rust Belt and the, uh, uh, the, the, the deprivation, we have to ask ourselves, why does it always represent itself as violence and violence against people of color in the main? You can have frustrations or vulnerability. Why should it always represent itself? That's where I think the barbarian image is very powerful. Mm -hmm. So uh, going, going with that image, what's barbaric? Um, how US citizens in Puerto Rico are being treated. Absolutely. Yeah? And so uh, you know, in my, my book, Body and Soul, I write a, about, um, I use a concept called the citizenship contradiction, right? That is, um, uh, you know, that's, I think it's uh, true and true in African American history, but coming up against again and again being the one counter example to the ideals or the, the sort of typically um, natural quotes process of democracy, always coming up against something else. And I think, um, you know, the example of what's happening in Puerto Rico right now is this citizenship contradiction born, you know, bare, naked. Um, you know, people of uh, who uh, don't have the, you know, all in scare quotes, the right language, who aren't the right color, um, who uh, don't have, uh, you know, resources. Um, and that it, not only can their citizenship be denied, but done so um, in a way that's, um, I guess, barbaric, right? That is not even willing to entertain um, the legitimacy of that claim. Uh, and so um, I think 
where I see uh, hope or possibility is that, you know, everything has just come apart. And we've had other examples of this, of course, um, throughout American history. But I, I do hope that um, there can be a convergence, as you say, uh, Homi, um, uh, around um, trying to cherish and put back together um, uh, some political possibilities for democracy. Mm. So I will come back right to democracy for a moment, but I mean, one of the things that I suspect is true in the case of Puerto Rico is that the vast majority of mainland Americans probably don't realize that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, right? It's, it's easy to deny them the rights of citizenship if you don't actually know that they're citizens. Forget whether you think they're citizens. And, and so, you know, knowledge is a critical dimension in here and, and awareness. And there is a narrowness of focus, uh, certainly among the, the sort of, uh, let's call it, uh, voters who support those nationalist positions, right? That it's, the idea of Puerto Rico is almost outside their frame of reference. So back to democracy. So I was a observation, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a sense that, uh, what are the instruments that we have? I mean, we have citizen efficacy, but what are those instruments that we have to, in a sense, um, uh, recharge citizenship? I mean, obviously the, the underlying issue here that is the rights of a citizen, and so what do we do about that? Yeah. Well, there has to be a combination of two kinds of, of mechanisms, and it's very hard to bring about. One is a lot of mobilization of people, the anger, indignation, or real concern, right? And that comes out in demonstrations and very often movements of this kind, but it has to connect to the representative system because the people, all right? And that is where we have the greatest difficulty. And people, very often when they, like Occupy movement, when they demonstrate, you say, well, are, you know, somebody asked them, are you going to vote in the next election? Vote. What's that got to do with it, right? So the energy of the demonstrators very often turns in a direction where it, it ends up not producing anything. And then on the other side, people who are in parties, you know, of the center left and so on, who should be connecting with this, think all oh, these people are so naive, they don't know what's going on and so on. So we have to have a way of bringing these two together. And a couple of examples where it worked for a while, uh, Obama's first campaign, right? That where you had a lot of organization and networking, but it was connected to voting for a oh, Democrat. And the slogan was, yes, we can, right? That it shows that they're answering a very deep need. And then, you know, another example is uh, one of the parties that emerged from the Indignados, and their name is Podemos, right? It's yes, we can, in Spanish. And these can actually make, uh, have, have an effect, but it's very hard to bring these coalitions together. And that's what you do, that's the big task we have. So can I, I, I absolutely take that. Can I then put the question to you, is the representational system with which we are working somehow one that does not, is not able to harness this positive affective, often affective, not only political rationality, but political affectivity, and actually make it productive. Is there something in democratic institutions now that seriously needs to be rethought, both at the formal level and at the political or ethical level? It's a big question, yeah. but I... I mean, I think that there are lots of things, but I think the really big missing thing is in the party system rather yes. than, right? And really, we're talking about now parties of the left here, or parties which want to push, you know, the solidarity for their equality for their and so on. And they are very, you know, it, it's a very, very difficult uh, task, but they're not even facing it. I mean, the, you know, I hate to make a criticism, but the Democratic Party in the United States, I think, has really fallen down on, on the job. And I fear very much, in face of November 2018, that they won't do the work that could bring about a shift in the, in the control of the two houses, which could put an end to 
some of the really crazy things which are going on now. So it's there's something that is defective in the party system which and is not felt enough by the people actually you know, re leading and running these parties. In a way, see, Obama broke with that in his first election in 2008 because he had another kind of election campaign. And somehow that whole, that whole network ought to have been kept much more alive than it, than it was. So can I offer, going back to um, one of Glenn's earlier questions about social media, and I would love to, because I, anything I think about the individual or the self I learned from reading Charles Taylor, so I would love to think about you, think together with you about this. But part of what social media, certainly what we're learning about what Facebook did in the last election was um, a, you know, a precision um, level of thin slicing that was about the individual, right? And so, you know, the yes we can assumes that there are technologies variously, you know, um, social practices included, um, that help us to get to we. Um, and I think that uh, so much of the social media, if, if it's, you know, the investment and building up one's individual avatar, that is a new kind of authenticity that you wrote about, you know, in Sources of the Self, um, the investment and from a market standpoint, um, thin slicing individuals such that you can target them for, yeah. uh, you know, uh, a Russian purchased ad about for or against Black Lives Matter, right? This sort of, and so I, I feel like there's that some of the technology, although we think about the social of social media as being communitarianism, communitarian is actually very individualistic, mm -hmm. um, and that there's something about the, the social media that really mitigates against being able to have a weeness that would be a kind of first order. Yeah you know, need for, um, you know, having a political movement around weenus. Maybe we need to rethink the weenus. Mm. You know, I'm not sure, but but I, it, it seemed to me that this weenus of the imagined community, mm -hmm. maybe that whole social contract that we assume is in, is really in trouble. And here, if I might just throw a straight thought. I think weeness depends not just on the law, you know. It doesn't depend simply on the constitution of the law. But it depends on something that I'm going to call the positive nature of shame. Not the, not the you know, not shaming somebody, but th this internal ethical sense of shame. I think we live profoundly now in a post-guilt world. Mm -hmm. Nobody is guilty about telling lies. Uh, w w what's the name of that? Sean Spicer. <laughs> you know, Sean Spicer acknowledges now that he feels very bad. He feels very guilty about misleading the world. He feels very bad about it. In India, you can borrow hundreds of millions you can bribe your way through or you don't pay them back to the banks. You go and sit in jail, you come out of jail and you say, I've done my time. So the notion of law and guilt, and I'm using law with the capital, somehow people, uh, guilt, it's past guilt now. But the frightening thing is that shame is a way in which you, you somehow treasure the community in which you live. Therefore, you don't want to be shamed. In that. This is Bernard Williams is the necessity of shame, the last chapters of the necessity of shame about the, you know, the, about the classical, classical tragedy. So I think that's what is being we, we've lost. Nobody is ashamed anymore. Nobody is ashamed to stand up and say, when I gave my sp inaugural speech, there were millions there. Then I looked at the photographs and there were these empty spaces. What did this horrible press do? People are not yet. Then, of course, I'm only giving a trivial example. I do think we have this real problem now, that we live in a post-guilt world, and, we are, and, and, sh and the pos positive resources of the self and shame, which are communitarian. And I think Du Bois was a great person to talk about this. Uh, that is, is, is being lost. And somehow the social media, which gives you continually access to a virtual commons, is not able to pull it together. Yeah. And when we actually want to protest, whether it's the Arab Spring, tragically, or whatever, we actually go out there with our bodies. 
And that's where we might actually also think back on Anna's work and the work of others where the embodiment of presence is so important. Whether it's representational, cinematic, it doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the physical body, but I'm talking about presence and taking a stand. Because after all, standing, the notion of standing is central to citizenship. It's the verticality of a certain virtue. It's not about physicality. Yeah. I mean, the, the communities have to be more than virtual. Yes. The idea that a community can be totally Correct. virtual, it has to have the non-virtual moment, yeah. and then the virtual moments can have a meaning. And I think you see this in the tremendous importance of turning out together for a demonstration. Or I'm thinking of the, an earlier period in Turkey when we had hope, the demonstrations around Gezi Square and so on, where people came from different backgrounds, and they enacted citizenship. They really enacted coming together and forming a kind of unity from out of their differences. And it was, this is really tremendously important that it wasn't thought out, they didn't talk about it by texting, they enacted it. And as you say, the embodiment of it is a very important element, a very important moment. We won't have real community without embodiment. So now maybe a question for, uh, for you. Uh, um, I think places where we converge in a give or take democratic spirit are universities, museums, libraries, you know, these cultural institutions where we, where it's our cultural citizenship, not our social or, polit or political or legal citizenship that is being charged. So, Glenn, tell Give us the story of the museum as a convening space now, because you are as embedded in all the squalor we've talked about, and yet you have these very beautiful things, and you have these wonderful colleagues, and you are reaching out and convening communities and, and every day. And so we do too in a university, but since we're here, let's talk about the role not of political parties, I think you're absolutely right, they've lost something of their representationally and you're not a political body in that sense. But just let's talk about the convening and the cultural convening of the citizenship in the museum. Well, I think the issue is absolutely germane to the struggle all of us in the museum world are going through as we try to define what it means to be in a museum, and an art museum in particular, at this moment. And we're subject to the same forces and changes and issues that exist outside the walls of the museum. And so the, one of the things that I've been struck by over, let's say, the last decade, definitely pre-Trump and, and even pre-Barack uh, Obama, is the, the shifting nature of the expectation of the institution. Yes. Uh, and if we internally or externally could could identify our mission solely around its the product of our of cultural endeavor uh, and art being at the top of this this spectrum. I think what's happened is we've come to understand actually that we're part of civic society and that we're social spaces. And here, I think that opens up the idea of the museum in really powerful ways that you don't come to a museum to be alone and to convene with a work of art as the kind of German romantic notion might have uh, articulated it. You come actually to be with other people, to be physically in the presence of other people. So it is, whatever its virtual dimension and might be, there is a fundamentally physical reality that people want. They have a desire to look at art with other people and to talk about it. Uh, and so what I see happening is that museums are becoming places of, they're almost like crucibles, uh, where different and often competing perspectives can converge and possibly be even forged into some kind of common experience and language, where people of fundamentally different backgrounds with fundamentally different values can find some common space and common set of issues to debate and discuss. Even if they don't ultimately agree, they, the museum op 
offers it the place in which those conversations can occur. It gives license to those conversations. And what's interesting is, like other aspects of our culture, that notion of the museum itself is under debate and uh, pressure from those who don't want it to, to be an active social space, who want it to be a preserved sanctuary, who, who resist the idea that the museum is a place of people uh, and is crowded and is noisy and is all of the things that civic space should be. To others who want to control what is represented in the institution, right? And, uh, and you can go down a list of competing agendas. And somehow I think, at least for the moment, the most successful museums have found a way of balancing those different demands and activating their social condition and maybe even their social responsibility, which is why debates about appropriation, democracy, citizenship, which might not otherwise have occurred in a museum. We might have been subject to the, subject to the critique, but we might, we might not have been the locus of the conversation. It's changing, and I think it's changing for all of the right reasons. Uh, and so I'm interested in a way to, to push that. For me, we won't be successful unless we are a loud, and I don't mean that by volume, I mean it by energy, uh, an energetic, robust place that embraces divergent points of view and can allow those conversations to occur, ideally creating points of convergence, but I'm less, though that's an outcome, convergence, right? I'm, I actually think our role is to catalyze the possibility of convergence, but not to worry about whether it occurs, right? That, that's beyond our um, ability. So how do you realize that? You realize it by challenging your own ideas, the status quo. You realize it by inviting uh, debate, uh, contention, uh, and demonstrating that you can deal with difficult ideas and not be upset by them, that it is actually possible for disagreement to occur without it immediately boiling down to an argument. And I, that's why I was so interested in Kelly Oliver's piece, which, which has to do with the speed at which debate can become um, so polarized that we lose the possibility of unpacking the legitimate ideas that need to be teased out. So if I could offer, you know, one of the thinking about from the social science perspective, I mean, and I think it's carried in, pu in public discourse, carried forward, we think about institutions as being glacial, as being stayed, as being not moving. But Glenn, as you say, they're constellations of people and they're actually quite dynamic ecologies. And so I think that we, sometimes forget that when you place that first painting by a woman in a modern art collection, that it's going to bring into the museum, like the whole ecology is changing every time we make a change. And I think you see this at universities as well. There was a hope, I think, for some universities that you could change the people and not have to change the institution. But to change the people is to change the institution. And so our surprise about the rows that we are having shouldn't be a surprise because we have set the stage for them to happen. And so it means that rather than say, um, it's loud, who are these people, you know, who are these students that we now at my beloved Columbia have to remember we have to feed people, students during holiday breaks. Everyone doesn't go home for a holiday. Everyone can't go home for a holiday. We should have known that, right? But we imagined that the institution was gonna stay exactly the same and we were gonna add some new bodies and stir. And, you know, so I think, um, and this is why I feel like we should celebrate the polarization. Not that we, the polarization is, is not a tenable <laughs> long-term road, right? But it's, it suggests that um, there are a cacophony of voices that are trying to figure out what various institutions can and will look like if and when this settles. You know, I was just, sorry. No, no, please. I was just uh, 
reading the Tower of Babel story mm -hmm. again yesterday. And of course, God there plays a rather terrible role. <laughs> he says, these people, if they speak the same language, they're going to oppose me. So now I'm going to throw chaos here, and they will all speak different. So it's actually about the politics of difference, and then how you put it somehow together again. And since I started this idea of convergence, I just want to um, get back to it and say that, of course, museums and universities are social spaces. They're spaces where civic uh, responsibilities and, uh, and, and, and identities, notions of authority to go back, are you learn how to, how to create a kind of a good authority, not authoritarianism, you dialogue and so on. But I'm interested in the fact that people, that there is a third thing here, which is the work. And people come to the museum not because, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, they come to the museum to be mediated through that work. And the beauty of the museum is that the work has its enigma. It, it, it's not like picking up the newspaper and getting a, it, an information. There are, of course, informatics within. There are languages within the work, just like in dance or theater. But there is something about aesthetic, I don't know how to put it, not distancing maybe, or there is, there is a temporality of the aesthetic, which does two things. It convenes you without the notion that there has to be consensus. Yeah. Right? It convenes you without the notion there has to be consensus. Yeah. That, I think, is, uh, is, is very important. It, it doesn't have that kind of sovereign, sovereignty around it. It's anti-sovereign in that way. If properly curated, and we haven't talked about curation, which is absolutely central in the arts. But there is also something else here, which is that convened by cultural practices, if I might use that phrase, is to be convened differently into the civic space than to be convened by political rhetoric or political discourse. And I'm not saying the one is better or one is less essential, but I just want to think about different convergent spaces. And I, I, I feel that this mediation, the thing that art gives you or the thing that literature gives you, pull, puts you in another temporal scale. But it also allows people to act out. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we talk about cultural rights, but most of the debates we've had about cultural rights recently, starting from Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses, or, um, you know, has been, have been about works, about the way in which works have unsettled us. So I think the aesthetic work in the larger Schillerian sense, or the Kantian sense, is a very important thing. And we sh so it's not so, sh it's, uh, it's converging in a certain, or mediated through uh, uh, an aesthetic, ethical. Well, well I think <clears throat> we're, we're dealing now with a very bad polarization. You see, I don't think it's either polarization or consensus. I think really what we want is the sense that we're having a debate where I need you as a partner because yeah. I'm not quite sure, right? So I mean, I'm a social democrat. I need the right kind of conservative. Yeah. Right? And the right kind of conservative is disappearing. I mean, what are they, <laughs> you know, it stays, what do they want to conserve? Not the planet, not the health of this population, not really living community, what do they want? to conserve. But if you have a conservative party that really has some sense, that there's some real value that we mustn't lose in the, I need that. Uh, and they need, they need people like us in, in, a, in a partnership where we're never going to totally agree, but we really, we fructify our own position by talking I about thought it. art, I, that's what I was suggesting. And that's the third you're right, space in which you can art, have yeah. a larger idea where you can yeah. disagree, but you embrace a larger exactly. idea. So, exactly. Yeah. So the interesting thing about that is, of course, you go to an art museum to look at art and to think about art, uh, but you have to have license to do that. Yeah. You know, we may be a public space, uh, and admission may be free on certain days and at certain hours, so that the barrier, the economic barriers are removed, but yet, not everybody wants to come to a museum, and even those who want to come don't always feel welcome. So there are, even within our, our space, 
there's a need to find ways to open it up so that it, it, it is as open a forum as it can be. And, and one of the things that's interesting about museums of modern art is that often the critique is, I don't understand, right? That instead of the engagement, there's bafflement. Uh, and bafflement quickly leads to resistance and even to anger, uh, right? And so we, we combat that, right? That is part of our uh, agenda, is to find ways to channel that bafflement away from anger to curiosity, right? And to uh, recognize, and, and one of the ways that that happens, I think, is the social activation, is that you're not the only person in here who doesn't understand what you're looking at. You're not alone, and it's okay. In fact, this comes back to something that I think you've written about or commented on, Homie, and that I think is a kind, it, it's actually what's missing in your um, progressive conservative um, axis, which is the welcoming of dissension. That, that if we live in, an, the, those, the new conservatives don't allow for, don't permit for the idea of dissent. Okay. Okay. So once you remove dissent as, a, as an active participatory process, then you've closed down any possibility of a dialogue. So uh, t when I think about the museum, and especially after you know, listening to some of your comments, Homie, is we want to be a place of dissension yep. that, that actually uses dissent productively to get at why works of art are meaningful. And after all, much of modern and contemporary art has been an act of dissent uh, against the status quo, against pre-existing norms, whatever it might have been. Uh, I know we're passing around uh, or collecting cards from those who might have a question and le Anyone else to pass, them down? pass them forward and as we continue our conversation I will endeavor to read your handwriting uh, and, and uh, I, would, I would just make a well while you're sorting Glenn you know a, a rather obvious point but I think a point that should be made and is that um, you know dissension in this space um, there's a kind of safety to it, or there can be, and that dissension and um, many other public spaces is criminalized. And so, um, you know, thinking about as someone who studies civil rights movement, contemporary political social movements, um, you think of, you know, I'm, I, when I look at uh, a movement like Black Lives Matter, um, and it's the immediate criminalization of that, you know, you're reminded of the impossibility of people being able to take risks in the street. I mean, you can even think about Egypt, you can think about Turkey. Um, there's not a sort of sense that w one can take chances with dissent. You get one shot at dissent and it's sort of immediately criminalized and shut down. And so, um, and I can't help but think that that has um, sort of ripple effects in political life and in a broader sort of way. Um, that dissension has become through its deep criminalization, kind of impossible. And, 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 and indeed, maybe this is one of the spaces that it might only be possible, I don't know. Um, but uh, um, I, I think that's it's, you know, a problem. Well, it's, it's fundamentally anti-democratic when that happens, which relates to a question that uh, one of our members in the audience uh, framed, which is to talk, if, if we could, one of you could talk about or elaborate on the relationship between authority and history, right? Because those, and that interconnection, and particularly um, they're interested in the relationship of how history changes and the impact that has on the monuments that uh, have been uh, so recently attacked and pulled down in some instances. And uh, what are the, how, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with, with a, a changing set of histories and, it's, and, their, and those new histories' relationship to the authority of the past? <clears throat> I mean, I think that this, this recent set of disputes about taking down monuments is a really more a phony issue of history because those monuments, I mean, Robert E. Lee's monument wasn't up there since uh, 1865. It was put there, I think, in 1924. In other words, it was put there at a period when there was an attempt to uh, suppress the resistance to Jim Crow you know, by lynching and by other, other means. So it speaks to 
uh, I mean, it speaks to a piece of U.S. history, but <laughs> the most terrible piece of U.S. history. And I think very often we confuse that kind of thing with uh, wanting to rename Woodrow Wilson College and so on, which is a totally different thing. This is some figure who has many meanings, including one very negative one on the racial level, very negative one, but a positive one on other levels. And uh, the college being named that wasn't part of a campaign to suppress that other, that other truth. So I think that uh, you know this issue about respecting our history and so on is very uh, is really wrongly applied to this whole set of issues which is you know, something very much more recent that <laughs> I agree I mean this is not capital H history this is history as a political claim it's cr history as a political tactic and so um, uh, you know what's interesting about you know one can think about um, Maurice uh, Halbach's work about collective memory and about how collective memory, we might extend that and say commemoration is actually always about the politics of the present, right? And it sort of masquerades or performs itself as being engaged or concerned with the past. And it's really about this moment. And so, you know, of course, you know, you're right, Chuck, about um, not only, you know, in the 1920s, but um, right after Brown v. Board in the South, right? In 1955 and 1957, you see um, a kind of, you know, that we don't talk about enough, this is a kind of gendered white nationalism, right? This is a kind of a performance of a kind of white womanhood that has these daughters of the Confederacy groups and the like who see it as their charge, as a gendered kind of participation and a white nationalist project to put these monuments up all over the United States. And so that's what I think has been um, so interesting, that sort of coming to light. But I think that's true about not only the monuments, but about a lot of or kind of politics of the past in which we're sort of looking back to think about what we can say um, uh, in this particular moment. So I guess I would say be cautious of what history does here and means in this question. Yes, I think that those particular instances you talk about were really the use of monuments to repress a certain kind of history and to create a certain kind of triumphal hegemony. So monuments that are set up particularly to make you lose historical memory, to erase historical memory, these are not historical monuments. These are ways of creating public memory or, 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 or creating monuments that in a way repress public memory. And I think that there is, it's clear there what to do. Now, of course, in Bombay, as you know very well, Glenn, uh, all the, more most of the colonial monuments and statues have not been destroyed, but they've all been put in the zoo. So if you go to the zoo in Bombay, you just see them all lined up one next to the other. They have been replaced by really some hideous national or nationalist monuments, but we won't, we won't go there. But to go back to uh, the, the question of dissent that I, I, brought, I brought up. And I, it's not about, and I think we agree on this, it's not about assent and dissent. It's not about those polarities. It's about doubt, mm -hmm. you know, the, the productive use of doubt. So I think in many of these issues of renaming or reclaiming, the issue is how to deal with ambivalence. And we're not that good at dealing with loving and hating at the same time, and what that means. You know, of course, psychoanalysis is, an, is built on the question of, of, of ambivalence, as a certain other more phenomenological ways of thinking. But I think with this notion of how do I return to this historical past, what do I preserve, what do I not, uh, it's just not forgetting and remembering, but it's somehow remembering, forgetting, remembering, forgetting at the same time. And it's to do with how we are taught to deal with ambivalence. An image that you may dislike from one perspective, you see the importance of it being there as a prod to memory. You have to live with that anxiety. And I think anxiety and ambivalence are extremely important pedagogically, and they're also extremely important ethically, to hold that tension. Unfortunately, very often, the tension is, 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 is cast away, and then there is a kind of you know, blame and praise. And so I think this is a difficult issue. So that, that gets us back, in a way, to appropriation, or the yeah. issues around appropriation, because 
at least in a number of the um, more recent controversies, it has been about anxiety, it's, right? Of course. That, and so are there conditions, are there when appropriation is appropriate? Yeah. In other words, uh, where we talked about Anna DeVere Smith's yeah. work and why, why it, 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 it works, but within the visual arts where one doesn't have the long performative dimensions of the Good theater. Point. Good point. How are there, how do we know when, when, when something is appropriate and how do we know when it's misappropriate? Now, I, I personally would find it difficult to answer this without a particular work in front of me, but let me just say when I think it's inappropriate. I think it's inappropriate when somebody's symbolic, symbolic vocabulary, historical experience, cultural practice is being, is being used, sanitized, transformed for the leverage of a position or a perspective that is antithetical to its, um, to, to, to its, to, to its interpretation. Now you can see, I'm being very, I'm trying to be rather skillful here because I'm saying that there is always an interpretational, uh, you know, responsibility. So there's nothing speaks just for itself. But I think you can tell when things are leveraged, and the, and and the and the and the realm of values which which uh, which are feeding off that leverage are not part of the thing. Now, for uh, let me give you just one very simple example that comes from my interest in fashion. We have an exhibition for you upstairs. <laughs> I found the use of uh, certain kinds of black women models uh, and citations from certain kinds of cultural motifs or designs and the way that cultural was then transformed and placed on the, what do you call it, the cake, no, cake runway. Or runway, I have found that. Or I found, in a very different way, the use of the almost proto-anorexic figure as being one of the celebration of contemporary fashion. You know, almost illness. And that, a lot of that happened around the time, not the first generation of the AIDS, but the second. I thought that was appalling appropriation. And I, th and I think, I, I mean, when you look at an artwork or any of them that you have here, it would be difficult to make that because I think those works really do engage you in this convergent tension that we've been talking about. But I think there is in the public domain a leveraging of history or experience or suffering for issues that are in a completely, almost antagonistic or antithetical world of values. So, you know, I won't pre pretend to be an expert of, about the art world, but as an outside observer, I would say um, there are lots of incentives for misappropriation and that um, there are uh, rewards to one's career, mm. rewards to um, the circulation and dissemination of one's work um, that can be, that are, that are yielded from forms of appropriation. And I think what I find troubling is a kind of um, agnotology, a kind of performance of innocence or ignorance around the use of appropriation as a strategy in the art world, you know? And so to me, that's where things get um, confused. I mean, why not just say it? You know, I think, um, you know, some, a figure like Kara Walker is not appropriating others' work, but it's very clear that she's trying to create a charge in space, a charge in the art world, a charge in conversation. And I think sometimes the, the thinking of a couple of more recent art controversies kind of emerge where actually people who know better say, I can't believe that happened as a response to my work. You know, it's, um, you know, these are educated people who, um, uh, you know, who, who know better, who know about social norms, who know about cultural norms. And so, you know, I think I would appreciate um, uh, some honesty, actually, and not a performance of innocence or ignorance around what is actually a, um, a deliberate tactical 
move that's backed by very particular incentives in this social space. Can you find, can, can one really, can one really actually get, derive all that so easy, I mean, not so easily, yeah. but in a complicated, is it possible to get at all these things, the intention, the, you know, it's hard, like, I think it's hard to render intention, but I think that artists know better than, visual artists know better than us, the power of something visual. Um, and to depict something that is um, uh, uh, um, horrific or um, deeply charged from another space and time and to offer no account other than a performance of ignorance or in a sense, I mean, I just, you know, this goes back kind of to the, an idea about engagement or dialogue. I mean, it's, so it's not the, it's not the free zone itself. It's the f performance that what one has done has not created a free zone. I think, you know, a around appropriation. Well, so you're saying it's an, it's an, um, um, it's a, it's an, it's an after, after response thing. I don't know why this was. Right. But I can tell you just a very Please, quick anecdote yeah. on this. Yeah. I invited Salman Rushdie to dinner, I have my, my home in London, just after Satanic, he'd sent me an early copy of Satanic Verses. And we had a two and a half hour dinner. And he described every inch of the book. And all kinds of possibilities, etc. And never once, and the book was just out, you know, it was being re never once did he say on that occasion, Tomorrow there will be a fatwa, or in two months there will be a fatwa. So, now maybe, I mean, I, I just lay that out to you, that I think that there is a way in which the creative unconscious works that can be opaque to itself in relation to certain kinds of readings. I, 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 I just put that out there, not that I, yeah. But it, don't you think in today's world, which was not Salman Rushdie's world 20 plus years ago, where information flows so much more rapidly uh, that if you're going to use uh, imagery, written, visual, uh, imagined, uh, that is appropriated, you have a responsibility in a way to ensuring that that you have done the best you can to put that in the world intelligently. It's not an innocent act. I think that's what you were getting at, Alondra, that, that, that you know it's charged. Uh, so once you know it's charged, is the artist excused from uh, the responsibility of its reception? Or do we actually have, when we use those images, do we have a responsibility to be intelligent about it, to be thoughtful about what will become, as it were. I mean, uh, Salman might have said, well, I had no idea that it'd be a fatwa, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I had a conversation with him not long after you presumably did. I mean, there's a certain naivete there, willful naivete, uh, when you start dealing with highly charged images, right? You, you, no matter how compelling or boring the description might be, you know that when you invoke those religious images and you do so against the backdrop of religious fundamentalism, somebody might just say, I have a problem with this. But, but Glenn, so do you, so I know you're not saying, therefore you don't do it. No, 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 but no, no, no. But you're saying no. what, once you've done it, what do you do? Because then you can't quite control the discussion. You can't quite say, now come and sit down and talk with me about this because there are many people who want to kill you. You know, they don't want to come and talk to you. They want to spit on you. Right. Uh, they want to tear your work down, or they want to burn the book. So I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I think I, it's very productive. So what do you do? You don't. You don't want to create a kind of loop back where there is a self censorship. You don't want to do that. But on the and so, I think the proposal that one should intelligently live up to the crisis, but then the crisis can be of very different kinds. And if we try to police those crises and say, this is permissible, but that is not. If you, then I, I, I wasn't going there at all. So fact. tell and me. I, yeah. And I wasn't even thinking about uh, the moment
post crisis. I was I was thinking along Alondra's lines or trying to imagine along Alondra's lines. How does I, I believe artists have the right to use whatever imagery they want. Uh, Carol Walker may not have appropriated imagery, she appropriated a technique, and a technique that itself was highly charged. So it, it isn't just the imagery that can be appropriated, it's the means of representation that, that can mm -hmm, be appropriated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think, and I certainly don't, don't want or believe in self-censorship. It was more to think about, okay, you're still a sentient human being. Uh, you, you, you're making choices, so when you make those choices, do you, and it's more of the question, do you have a responsibility to think about how you put them in the world, or is it such a free act that, one is inno that one's innocence here um, is, is sufficient? I don't think it's about innocence. I get the point. But it's about the creative process that you're talking about now. It's not even the process of reception, am I right? right? Correct. So that there is no act gratuit, you know, right. of course. And, and I think, but supposing I am writing, you know, and I want to be desperately blasphemous or desperately pornographic about something, what should I be thinking about? What should I be reflecting on? And what sort of decision, and, and what's the range of decisions I would make? Uh, and I, I'm, you know, I don't have Salman's courage, you know. I would never have done something like that. God forbid, you know. I would have been very careful. I, or maybe I wouldn't have been. I don't know. It's impossible to tell. But what would I do? Would I say, you know, now uh, to say that the wives of, Muhammad, you know, had the names of prostitutes, or prostitutes were named, or whatever, you know, all these things that people found flagrantly insulting in a country where there is already, you know, what are the decisions that I would make? I mean, I, I think it's okay to be radically blasphemous, right? Okay. But then not to say when it comes out, I can't believe people think this is so blasphemous, oh. and, and it's controversial. <laughs> I mean, say, like, so, I publish something that's blasphemous, and, like, let's have a fight about so, it. Good. Or let's have a conversation so about it. So that's a different, you know, I think you're at the other end. You're mm -hmm. at the reception end, and you're at the construction mm -hmm. end. And I think that's very interesting, and I'm not sure how to, to tie those two things together. And, I, and I'm, I'm asking it as a question rather yeah, you're than, as a question. As, it's a good rather question. than forming it as a statement. But it's interesting because yeah. usually we do it at the other mm -hmm. end, you know. Now there's a crisis, now let's kind of tr 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 throw water on it or invite people to a seminar to discuss it. But given the new technologies, you know, the temporalities are different. Yeah. People don't come around. People immediately, you know, take to, take to Twitter or wherever they take to. But even, you know, what is interesting, we talk about the instantane, about the citability of new technologies where yes. you can take four lines and destroy somebody's career, you know. But with, in, it was interesting with the satanic verses that in the mosque in Regent's Park in London, the way in which the text was distributed for this kind of, inf I don't, the, for this kind of, as, as a site of insult, was through quotations. They would distribute in the, the, in the, the on the Friday uh -huh. prayers, uh -huh. they would distribute to everybody five lines from here, seven lines from there. You know, the most insulting lines. That seemed to me to be rather like those modernist techniques of cut and paste, yes. you know, yes. those things. So I thought, it's amazing how strange the world is. It's, you know, the sort of citationality that we have now. Well, a strange world it is, uh, and I think we, uh, should bring this conversation to a happy close with the notion of strangeness and being in the world and to thank all of you for having joined us, but especially Homi, Alondra, and Chuck for being so stimulating. <laughs>